share the screen for the agenda for today. I can. So everyone, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Welcome to our Zoom meeting. Uh, so here's the ad agenda, and uh, the team will take care of it uh, today. Thank you for the presenters in advance. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, can anybody see me clearly? Yes, we can see you. Okay, so hello everybody again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm glad to, to meet you again, guys. And today we have a bunch of topics to be talking about. Uh, we'll be uh, starting with Dr. Fathiyya. We'll talk about uh, the, the pressure ulcer and elderly people and how can that impact the quality of life of a geriatric people. Are you ready, Dr. Fathiyya? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Okay, board is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the presentation. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Fathiyya Muhammad, and today's presentation is made by the Pink team under the leadership of Dr. Muhammad Miqdad. And the presentation was put together by Dr. Ron Awad, Dr. Hassan Sayed, and myself. So we'll be talking about pressure ulcers in the elderly. Um, we have about four points that whenever we're done with the presentation, you guys need to walk out with, okay? The first one, we need to know how to identify the patient risk of developing. Um, are you guys, I will see my screen actually before I move on. Just yep. wanna make sure yep. that you can see my screen. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so the four points are how to identify the patient's risk of developing pressure ulcers, and how to, how to identify the actual stage of the ulcer, and how to prevent the ulcers from formation, and how to manage. We'll just touch briefly on the management as well. All right. Actually, do, do we see the screen? I don't... I see you on... Dr. The... Nafisa? Okay. Are you able to see my screen? No, 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 no. All right, let me do it again. How about now? Yes. Yes. Now we can. Now you can see it. Awesome. All right. Good. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, all right. So those are the two objectives that we just covered. So we're gonna go ahead and dive in by defining what a pressure ulcer is. So a pressure ulcer is an area of localized damage to the skin and the underlying tissue. That could be like the uh, epidermis, dermis, the fat tissue, the muscle and the tendons and everything underneath it. And uh, it's caused by pressure, shear, friction, or any combination of the three. Uh, the pressure points that we have are depending on the position the patient is at. So they could be in supine position, you'll have different pressure points. If they're on the lateral position, you'll have different ones and prone and so on. Uh, bear in mind that the pressure ulcers, they most uh, commonly occur over any body prominence and they could develop on any part of the body. If the patient have any splints or casts, that could develop an ulcer underneath it as well. Uh, if the patient, they have external fixation devices like an orthopedic patient, uh, the patients who are in the ICU, they have like NG tubes and so on. If the tube is not cleaned uh, properly, they could develop an ulcer underneath the tube. And uh, whenever they place the pulse off over their fingers, over their thumbs, if it's not cleaned properly all the time, they could develop an ulcer as well. So just bear in mind, could be anywhere, any place. Uh, just a few examples. Uh, whenever the patient is in the supine position, those are the most common spots where they could develop an ulcer, which is the occiput, the vertebrae, the elbow, the sacrum, heels, and the toes. Basically, any uh, pressure point that the patient is leaning on. We'll see a few pictures, like live pictures. This is a picture of an ulcer formed in the ear and another one in the occiput. There are obviously different stages. We'll address that in a minute. This is a live picture on the sacrum as well. And this is in the lateral position as well. And this is the prone position. So you can tell the different spots depending on the position the patient is laying on. Okay, let's go ahead and address the stages of the, uh, the pressure ulcer. So stage one, uh, basically you will see an intact skin 
with net blanchable redness or erythema of intact skin of a localized area. Usually it's above a uh, bony prominence or it could be just a regular area, uh, not above a uh, bony prominence, it doesn't matter. Uh, what you expect to see is some discoloration of the skin. Um, the area might be a bit warm. There might be some swelling and hardness may also be used as an indicator if somebody is dark skinned. Obviously for somebody with darker skin, you're not gonna be able to see the erythema. It's not gonna be that obvious, but your indicator could be if it feels warm, if it's, there's some swelling, if it feels hard, that could be an indicator as well. So we need to be mindful of that. Uh, that was stage one. Uh, stage two, we have partial sickness loss of the epidermis and the dermis. The alpha usually appears superficial. Uh, it could look like an abrasion, like a little blister, or just a shallow crater as well. Um, a shiny or dry shallow alpha without sloughing or bruising. So this is just the histology part. The upper layer, that's the uh, epidermis. This is the dermis and the this tissue. This is the fatty layer. And then we have the muscle and obviously the bone. So in stage one, as we said, none of this would be happening because you could see an intact skin. This is stage two, where the epidermis and the dermis are both affected, but everything underneath it is completely intact. And this is a live picture of stage two. Some redness, some abrasions, blisters, just like a regular ulcer. The, moving on to stage three, we have full fitness tissue loss. So in this case, the subcutaneous fat may be visible, but the bone, the tendons, the muscles, everything underneath are not exposed. Uh, the histology part is over here, so we can tell the epidermis and the dermis are affected, and also the underneath tissue as well. So you could see some of the fatty tissue here. This layer could be obviously visible, and this is a live picture. You can see the fat tissue over here. This is stage three. In stage four, here we see a full thickness tissue loss with exposed bone. You could actually see the tendons, you can see the muscles. Uh, there's usually a tissue necrosis that happens. There might be some damage uh, on the muscles, the bones, or the supporting structures in general. The histology part is shown here. Everything is affected. Even the bone here, you can actually, it might be visible as well. This is a live picture. It's not pretty, so we need to be mindful. So those were the four stages. So as we said, just to recap real quick, in stage one, you have intact skin, nothing is going on whatsoever. There's some warmth, uh, maybe a little redness. It could be some hardening and that will be it. In stage two, it looks like an ulcer with abrasions, but the skin uh, is scraped a little bit, but you're not gonna be able to see any of the underlying tissue. In stage three, uh, the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous tissue is all affected. You could see all until you see the fat tissue as well. In stage four, you might be able to see some of the muscles, the tendons, and possibly the bone. All right, so what are the factors that play a part in the formation of the pressure ulcers? So we have about three factors. Uh, the first one is the tissue tolerance, which is the integrity of the skin itself. Basically, if the patient has uh, any cracks in the skin, the skin is super dry, they'll be more prone to have an ulcer. While the skin is, if it's moist, if it's moisturized, then they then have less risk of the ulcer as well. And the reason why we're addressing the uh, pelvic, uh, the pressure ulcers in the elderly is because their skin is very thin. It's super, like they don't have any collagen, no elastin, and uh, they're very prone to pressure ulcers. So the other factor is shearing. So shearing occurs when the patient slides downward with gravity while the skin remains in the original position. That causes stretching and tearing of the blood vessels, and that causes tissue ischemia. Uh, that basically, whenever you see a patient that's laying, uh, let's say in a cardiac bed, so he would be lying this flat, and then it's like 45 degrees or so. Uh, so the gravity is gonna pull down the entire body, like the skin, and the bone, everything, but the skin is gonna stay in place. So that causes some tearing in the blood vessels. Like if you have a grandma that's like old, uh, you could probably see that happening a lot. Uh, the friction is the third uh, factor, which occurs when two surfaces move across each other, removing the superficial layers of the skin, usually over a bony prominence. Like whenever you have two items that are friction against each other, uh, rubbing against each other, then some of the layers might fall off and then they'll be more exposed and more prone to developing pressure ulcers as well. All right, so now we're moving on to the prevention. Um, so what are the risk factors? to develop uh, pressure ulcers. 
So more risk factors, we just talk about the factors, but the other risk factors are if the patients are older, more than 65 years old, if they're diabetic, obviously they're more prone. Uh, if they have any edema, like the patient is in heart failure, liver failure, renal failure, have an edema on the surface uh, already that um, affects the integrity of the skin. So they'll be more prone to developing any pressure ulcers. Um, if they have any vessel constrictive diseases, they have uh, PADs, PVDs, that kind of stuff. The other factors that affect the, uh, the whole process of developing an ulcer are also the skin hygiene, the skin moisture, skin temperature, skin integrity, uh, skin scarring. Um, if the patient have like any fecal incontinence or they have urinary incontinence as well, because the surface is gonna be wet all the time. Uh, if they have any skin discomfort, like if they have any pain, they have itching, any loss of sensation. Uh, if they already have like an abscess or the skin infection, uh, if there's abscess of the skin layers, all those are factors to developing an uh, pressure ulcer, which they do happen a lot in the elderly who may be admitted or they're like uh, assisted living facilities where not a lot of people are taking care of them. So that could be a factor. So the most important factor actually is position. Um, so uh, as we said earlier, uh, the patient could develop an ulcer just by laying flat maybe for a little over 24 hours. If they're in a coma, they're not moving the stasis of the blood and the pressure point that could develop into an ulcer. So if possible, we need to reposition the patient every two hours, just to relieve the pressure from those affected areas. Um, we also need to avoid any high semi fibrous position for extended periods as it increases the shear and pressure forces in the sacral area. The patients who are usually put in the, like, the semi fibrous position um, are usually patients like in a, sitting in a cardiac bed, the patient in like 15 to 45 degree angle, help them breathe better and be more comfortable. So we need to avoid that as much as possible. Um, uh, if must be uh, positioned high risk patients on specialty beds if possible. So they have some specialty beds where the mattress kind of like automatically with the button just moves a little bit, some vibration, basically anything that would relieve the pressure from that affected area so they don't deliver after. Okay. So um, the thing that we could do for all the patients at the hospital who are going to be in a long stay, they're not moving, they're uh, in ICU, they're intubated, we need to start using gel pads. And they are for everyone who is in a long stay. So the gel pads, uh, you can put a gel pad arm on the arm board, just to relieve the pressure on the elbows. You can add a gel pad on the heels of the patient that wasn't in a suspicion sling. We can use gel pad head ring just to protect the occipital area here from the back. Um, we can use pillows to protect the bony prominences as well. And this is like very commonly used in hospitals nowadays. But gel pads are the way to go, I would say. The other precautions that we need to actually take care of is avoid pulling of fluids and or secretions under the patient. Um, let's say the patient has uh, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence. We need to keep an eye, like a close eye on those patients because if the surface is always wet and prone to infection, that's just the recipe for an ulcer. So we need to avoid pulling of secretions underneath them. Um, we need to keep the skin uh, nice and dry at all times by using powders and whatnot. Uh, we can take a special care of blood pressure cuffs, uh, the cuff area, and rotate the side if necessary. Uh, we know a lot of the ICU patients, they have the blood pressure cuff like all the time. So maybe we can just change the position, switch it from the right to the left, and just make sure to clean underneath it every single time. Um, also, the sheets, the patient gowns, or the linen, they must have no creases or folds. Because if you have a crease or a fold, that is a pressure point by itself. So we need to make sure that it's nice and smooth. All right, so those are just more of the uh, more of the care that we just talked about. Whenever you have the patient with like an NG tube, any probes, uh, they have any tubing underneath them as well, we need to keep an eye on those. Uh, it's the same thing over here. We just need to change the position every two hours or so. Uh, we need to apply the appropriate topical agent or dressing in relation to the ulcer characteristics as ordered. Uh, we'll address that in a minute when we come to the management. Um, we need to reassess the skin to check for any changes in the skin integrity. There are no cracks or braises or anything on the skin as well. Uh, this is a picture of a healthcare professional. He's just trying to, I think, flip the patient to the side. So this is actually a good idea if they're lying to find most of the time, we can just flip them to the side every two hours, the other side as well. Um, this is a picture of uh, a skin turgor test. Um, so skin with decreased turgor remains elevated after being pulled up and released. 
So I know in younger people, it only happens if the patient like hasn't drink water like in a long time or fasting, but in older people, they don't have a lot of elasticity. So it's very common in the elderly. All right, so before we pop into the quiz and ask you guys questions, um, we're just gonna brief over the treatment just real quick. So the treatment, uh, whenever you have an ulcer, we could use uh, debridement. Uh, we have several different types. There's like sharp debridement, there's a mechanical non-selective debridement. We have something called enzymatic debridement where they use like an ointment. Um, there's an orthotic debridement as well. Um, that's for people with like surgical rotations um, to know like all the details and the nitty gritty stuff about the topics. Um, we also intend to use uh, different types of dressings. Um, we have like a regular gauze that we use. Um, some people like to use the hydrocolloid dressings, um, gel dressings. We have the transparent adhesive dressing like Tegaderm. Um, some people like to use the calcium alginate dressings. It all depends on the which stage the ulcer is at at the point. All right, so I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, so, how often should you turn a patient to prevent pressure ulcer? That should be a rather um, easy question, I would say. You guys can go ahead and like type your answers in the chat if you like. Every two hours. Thank you so much, Zaha. And what stage is an ulcer uh, when you can see the fatty tissue, but there is no bone or muscle exposed? Stage three, awesome. You guys were paying attention. Amazing. So name two risk factors for developing a pressure ulcer. We mentioned a ton of risk factors, so. Any risk factors for developing a pressure ulcer? Diabetes, immobility, definitely. Very good. Elderly over 65, poor hygiene, perfect. Awesome. If you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and ask as well. I'm sure uh, me, Rowan, anybody could answer your question if you have any. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me today. And that is the reference here. Thank you, everyone. I'll exit and Dr. Mughdad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatiha, for this great presentation. Thank you. I like the way that the slides were moved and flowed in your presentation. That was I, nice. I, I loved it. It was nice. Yeah. I loved it too. Yeah. Honestly, that, that was nice. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah, you, have, you have to teach me how, how to do this later on. Huh? Sure. Yeah. I'll be more than so happy much. to, of course. So just give me a minute. Of course. Yeah. And if you if you don't mind to, to share the presentation with the attendees, Dr. Fatheya. Will do. Of course. Thanks. So going to the second topic about um, the medical devices related pressure injuries and how uh, can that be prevented? in the hospital setting and uh, how can that also impact the patient care and quality of life. Presentation will be um, by Dr. Naoud and Dr. Abtisam. The mic is yours, guys, you can go. Can you hear me? Yeah, clearly. Okay, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it clearly. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Nwad, and today we'll be presenting on preventing medical devices related pressure injuries, leveraging across different discipline items. I think the previous presenter was clearly explaining about the stage and type of pressure ulcer. So I will try to skip the presentation focusing on this point and we will try to focus on the <clears throat> medical devices 
And Dr. Itisam will present one case in which it will explain the numerical value of how many patients with medical uh, devices related pressure induced have been recorded, how is the percentile, the risk factor, and the outcome. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Okay. So this is the content for presentation for today. Today we will describe and we will define what is the definition of a medical device related uh, injury. And second, we'll try to look what are the medical device related pressure injuries, risk factors, common sites. And the third one, as previously explained by the previous presenter, the stage and pathophysiology. We will look some examples, the non-peculiar, the easy examples that uh, everybody knows it. We will also try to look on the consequences or outcomes of this pressure uh, related devices uh, ourselves. We will also discuss on preventive modalities, treatment, and Dr. Etisam will clearly analyze one research and it will give us with a numerical backing of this concept. So, with definition, a pressure induced the skin is a result of constant pressure due to impaired mobility. And in this case, which is the previous uh, concept of device related injury is secondary to a medical device. And what causes this is a reduced blood flow and eventually will cause cell death, skin breakdown and development of an open wound. Sometimes even for staying on a wheelchair for about two to six hours may also lead to a medical device related pressure injury. The damage will eventually spread to deep tissues affecting different muscle, tendon and bone. And uh, the the common sites are the sacrum, the back buttock, the heel, back of the head, elbow, which eventually lead to pain, disability, and infection. Uh, as we go through the presentation, try to focus on the red marking of my presentation because, because this is the concept of uh, the focus of the presentation. So the risk factor, as obviously previously explained, is shearing and friction of a continuous and interrupted. The concept of time should be here. Uh, have more focus, contact with supporting surface. We all sleep at the bed, we all sit at the chair, but if you sit or sleep uninterrupted on the basis of underlying medical condition, that time will be the factor whether you will eventually develop a pressure related, um, pressure related to a medical device uh, also. Second one is that the pressure goes on and the time goes on, moisture will promote infection, and there will be a decreased movement. This will eventually lead to the ulcer formation. On top of this, if you have any underlying medical conditions such as neuropathy, which will eventually cause a decreased sensation, or if you have circulatory problems, this will eventually lead to tissue death. And as a separate factor, if you have malnutrition, the chances of having the ulcer is also high. And uh, age is also a very um, bad prognosis factor in the chances of you developing a, any form of a pressure related uh, ulcer. I think this was already explained. So, as you can see in the presentation, the back of the head, on your back, on your buttock, your hair, and top of your head is the places where there is a direct contact of your body with the surface. This will explain the shear and the friction concept. This will eventually lead to decreased blood supply and formation of the ulcer. So as you can see, the heel, the tailbone, the elbow, the shoulder, and back of the head. If you are sitting in a wheelchair, the shoulder, the buttock, and the heel are also the sites where this uh, ulcer can happen. Now, the third concept is clinical. Why does this pressure ulcer uh, secondary to a medical device uh, occur, and how would it be presented? Number one is screen color change in texture, as obviously as the pressure goes on and on. There will be a, an apparent skin color change in texture. And I cannot stress enough the concept of swelling because this will eventually pinpoint the area in which the ulcer is developed. And this clinical sign may depend whether they are identified by a primary care provider or by a doctor. But these four concepts will eventually explain the clinical presentation of the pressure secondary the medical device. This will eventually uh, form a pass like draining from the side, which is a late finding. Sometimes there's also pressure discrepancies between the area, which is not under pressure, and with, between the area, which is under pressure. And of course, at the end of the day, tender areas may tend to have more pressure uh, 
related to our medical devices. So this is the main uh, point of this presentation. What are the medical devices or equipments which are uh, associated with uh, ulcer formation? This is the most uh, common devices that we are aware of, which is the bed, obviously, the stretchers, tourniquets, less likely if they are put on the patient for extended period of time, blood pressure equipment, especially in intensive care unit where the patient is required to be at under continuous 24 hour pressure, blood pressure measurement equipment. This uh, blood pressure equipment may also lead to the ulcer formation. In orthopedic patients such as castus or cast support might also lead to ulcer formation. <clears throat> in alcoholic patients, psychiatric patient, or uh, mentally deranged patient, bed restrainers secondary to any form of uh, restraining method used may also lead to um, formation of the ulcer. Even though some of the equipments which are here may not be directly considered as a medical equipment, they will eventually lead to formation of the ulcer. These are the less uh, conventional or not commonly mentioned uh, equipment. So feeding tubes. Uh, in case of feeding tubes, they will cause the mucosal ulcer rather than direct skin ulcer. Oxygen delivery tubes, intravenous catheter, poly catheter, orthopedic devices, negative pressure wound therapy, band pads or hard beds sometimes can also lead to ulcer formation. Abdominal binders. And the last two ID bands on braces are these are items which are brought with the patient to the hospital, but sometimes we can, may also be the cause of uh, ulcer formation. So here we have the sore concept, which is a mnemonic used to raise awareness of potential source of pressure injury. So the S standards for stock items, such as bedpan, diapers, uh, the TEDs, incontinent pads, and needle caps. The O stands for objects such as toys, cutlery, food item, toiletries, toothbrush, comb, hairbrush, eyeglasses, and bottle caps. And the third one, which is the focus of this presentation, is the required medical devices, such as the BV pap mask, IV hubs, endotracheal tube, tubes, drains, and this monitor, such as BP cups. The last one are accessories, such as phone, music player, tablet, charger, electrical equipment, call bell, razors, or hearing aids, which are brought to the hospital with the patient, which might not be directly considered as a medical equipment which is used in the hospital, but which might eventually lead to pressure ulcer in the patient. The first concept is how and where. Where is the medical device related pressure injury? It can either be in the skin and mucosa. The skin part has already been explained. Let's focus on the mucosa. The mucosa cannot be used by the previous staging technique used by the NPUP staging classification because you cannot visually assess the extent of damage in different mucosas. It will be the urethral mucosa, esophagus, stomach. So they are counted separately as a pressure injury and they use the CMS or the disease for um, center for the Medicare and medical devices uh, classification method to be classified as a directly medical device related injury. They can also be tracked uh, separately for trends. I think the stage of the ulcer has been explained, so let's skip this part. And let's come to the diagnosis uh, part. So pressure injury identification is supported by a wide variety of assessment tools. We have two concepts, the Braden scale and the Northern skin assessment. The Braden scale uh, purpose is to help health professionals like us especially nurses, and assist the risk of developing a pressure ulcer. So you use the Braden scale for medical professional, and the Northern Risk Assessment is used in evaluation of pressure injury raised based on the factors such as mobility or physical condition. So the first concept depends on your direct assessment. The second one depends on underlying condition of the patient. But the one that I chose to be very effective is the device mnemonic, which we will see in the next slide. So it will give us like a holistic approach to what to look, how to prevent, how to treat, and how to move on with the devices. Now we'll see who are the patients who need screening or attention. Number one is neonates. Because in neonates, if 
there is any external medical device used for uh, either for treatment or prevention method because they cannot speak and they cannot verbalize their pain any crime in a unit should be assessed on top of uh, the underlying medical condition then the patient should be screened for any um, catheter which is misplaced iv bag um, brazen bag should be uh, screened and the second one is infant, which also fall under the same uh, category. The third one is bed ridden patients, stroke patients, um, unconscious patients, epileptic patients, uh, alcoholic patients, psychiatric patients. So these patients need a specific screening or attention to prevent a medical device related to pressure injury. Uh, the fourth one is post-surgical patients. Patients may be unconscious for the coming one or two weeks or they may have a tendency to be on continuous form of stasis on the bed, so they also need a special attention. ICU patients, obviously, because they are continuously bedridden. Mentally deranged patients also, because mentally deranged patients tend to be ignored when they complain about any form of uh, physical or uh, mental uh, complaints, so you should also pay good attention to uh, mentally deranged patients, which also includes psychiatric patients. And the last concept is what are the diseases which would focus more? Number one is cancer. Number two is diabetes mellitus because of the neuropathy and blood vessel involvement. The third one is pulmonary failure. So if patient is under any form of pulmonary failure, he will eventually need any form of mechanical support. So any device that he use, NG tube, breathing tube, catheter, IV line should be screened as a red flag for a pressure uh, related uh, injury secondary to a medical device. Atherosclerotic disease for every reason because of blood uh, flow derangement and neurologic disease such as uh, stroke. So I try to skip all the pictures, which obviously at some point in your life you have faced it, such as bed sore, uh, foot sore. So I would try to focus on three or four pictures which we don't usually see, but maybe as a cause of uh, medical device related pressure ulcer. So this patient was on a cervical collar for a specific period of time, but as you can see, there is a development of uh, pressure uh, ulcer secondary to this medical device. The second one is an infant which was uh, using a feeding tube, but the baby eventually ended up pressing the tube and at some point developed an ulcer. It might not be apparent, but as you can see, this is secondary to a device in which the patient eventually uh, laid over. And this is a specific uh, pressure injury resulting from half of an IV line. So the IV line location is here, but the patient ended up sleeping on the area where the IV line was present. Can you see, guys? Yes. So it forms yes. an, an imprint on the patient. And this is the pressure injury from a thromboembolism uh, detergent stocks. So as you can see, the patch is secondary to an external factor, which has nothing to do with the current medication. Now, the importance of the uh, reporting. Um, any change noted in color, temperature, or pressure of skin breakdown should be reported immediately. To report a constant uh, change in the pressure, uh, I mean, the temperature and uh, pressure of the skin breakdown will eventually help us to identify the impending uh, ulcer. So, if nurses are not available, the individual should also take into their uh, primary care provider for an urgent care if the issues were not found on the working days. Delay in uh, seeking, uh, seeking medical care can be can result in the further injury and breakdown. So I will try to put the important question. Why is it important, the concept of reporting in medical related, medical device related pressure injuries? And what if the patient cannot report? The reason it's important in reporting is as I have previously showed in my slide, in medical devices related injury, the concept of time is really important. If the device has been, any form of device has been there for about one week or three days or four days, the recurrent repositioning at every time interval is a main factor of treatment. So the earlier the reporting, the less likely the medical device will form an answer. 
But what if the patient cannot report stroke patients, unconscious patient, psychiatric patient, and infant in neonate? Then this is where the concept of the device comes. So the, de the device uh, mnemonic is for prevention and treatment of medical device related pressure injuries. The D standards for determine that uh, all medical devices that will eventually cause pressure injury. So when you accept or receive a patient in any form of hospital, try to quickly scan what are the devices that will eventually cause a pressure injury in this patient. Second E, evaluate all devices. Every skin device interface and surrounding at least twice daily and more often in patients which have a localized or generalized edema. Then the distance verify that all nursing staff have been taught how to correctly use and secure medical devices and understand that mucosa related device and pressure injuries must be counted and tracked separately from skin pressure injuries. And when we come to the eye, identify all medical devices on all patients. D was determined what medical devices which will eventually cause injury in this patient. But in I, you have to identify the already placed medical devices in this patient that will eventually cause a pressure injury. So in critical ill patients, neonate children, older adults, and bariatric patients. And C stands for consider the following of any medical devices that are in use. Does the patient still require the device? That's why most of the time in ICU and emergency basis, you, uh, you advise patients to ambulate, to take off the uh, mechanical ventilation, to start uh, thorough uh, feeding so that you will remove all the devices and prevent the pressure ulcer secondary to those devices. And if the patient still requires to be on those devices, make sure that it is it fit correct. Can a prophylactic dressing can be used? Benis devices placed in high risk uh, areas, such as nasal bridge, for example. And last is educate all staff to look for objects that might be in the bed or under the patient. I cannot stress enough this concept because sometimes patients they may show up with their earphone, ring, chain that will eventually cause some pressure to the uh, patient, but those may not be considered as I have previously explained as a medical device, but as accessory that will eventually cause uh, pressure injury. What if, if prevention fails? Then we go on for treatment, identify the source of the pressure, minimize pressure by utilizing watch, frequent turning and repositioning uh, every two hours, as I have previously mentioned. Minimize the shear and friction to reduce and uh, to reduce the damage to the skin. The third one is control. Moisture skin should be kept clean and dry. Pain management, pressure injuries are helpful and may require um, medications such as anti-pain, especially around the treatment time. Bearer ointment should be used for after the incontinence, uh, sorry, after incontinence episode to protect the skin. This is like lubricants. Wound care may be required based on severity. Training for the nurse and staff on care in between appointments will be provided. So if all of this fail, then we can refer to a wound specialist at the end of the day. So this is the end of the presentation. What's the take home message of this presentation? One, try to identify when you receive a patient, which disease will eventually need some devices and which patient will eventually need some devices and which devices will eventually cause pressure related to a medical device and then eventual formation of ulcer. If you think the patient may need device, then assess the risk after putting the device, how likely the patient will develop the ulcer. If you decide that the device should be continuously in place in support of this patient, then how to prevent? What do I need to do? As we have explained in the previous uh, slide. Supposedly, if all of this fail, then how to proceed, which means or act if the ulcer has been formed or injury has been formed secondary to any medical device, then how do I proceed? And this one has already been explained in this slide. The last one is treatment, which is the last option. You can either refer to a wound specialist or you can do this preventive and treatment modalities that we discussed. These are my references. Thank you, guys. And after this, Dr. Ebtisan will proceed with uh, analysis of one uh, study. So she will try to give us like the numerical value or the concept of how many patients developed 
pressure related to medical device, how, how many of them have proceeded to have a permanent arrangement or how many of them have developed ourselves. So thank you very much for listening. I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naud. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Nader, Dr. Mohammed al -Baghdad. I'm going to present. Let me share it. Is it clear? Yes. 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 It's clear, Dr. Tissam. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm going to present um, an observational cohort study about the incidence and characteristic and risk factor of medical device related pressure injuries. Uh, first, uh, regarding the abstract, uh, the objectives was uh, that uh, aim to investigate the cumulative incidence characteristics and risk factor of medical devices related pressure including patient outcome uh, in the intensive care unit of University Hospital. The design used was a prospective observational cohort study. The setting was conducted in University Hospital between uh, November 2019 and October 2020. For the method, the study included patients over the age of 18 years, who had the device in situ and stayed uh, in the ICU for more than 24 hours. Uh, each device monitored twice a day for 15 days. The clinical assessment was performed daily until ICU discharge or death. And here are some of the skills and tools that used for the data collection, which are the case report form, uh, the medical devices related pressure monitoring form, the sequential organ failure assessment, SOFA score, acute physiology and chronic health evaluation, uh, Apache 2, braiding scale, national pressure uh, injury advisory panel, uh, staging and categories, and Glasgow Coma scale were used for data collection. Uh, already Dr. Naut uh, talked about them. Uh, patient, with and without uh, medical devices related pressure injuries were compared for demographic and clinical characteristics, length of ICU stay and mortality uh, by using a T test and chi square test. Community incidence was uh, calculated. Logistic regression model was used to investigate risk factors. Uh, for the results, the incidence rate of uh, medical devices related pressure injury was 48.8%, which is uh, 84 out of 172 patients. Most of uh, uh, the medical devices related pressure uh, injuries develop in the mucosa. And hence, in mucosa cannot be staged. Uh, they are not staged like those of the skin and other organs. Uh, they could be staged at is they, uh, they cannot be staged, so it's 63.7%. Uh, uh, the remaining of the me uh, medical device related pressure uh, on the skin are further categorized into stage one, stage two, stage three, respectively, with percentage of 18.7%, 13, and 4.6. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of anatomical location, most commonly occurred in the head and neck region. 62.3%. Uh, uh, um, among 12 uh, medical devices, uh, here we have uh, another classification uh, according to the medical device that cause, causes the injury, uh, like endotracheal tube, catheters, and G tube. And so, among 12 medical devices that cause uh, uh, medical device related pressure injury in the tracheal tube, uh, make uh, 61 cases, urinary catheter for 46 cases, nasogastric tube 30 cases, and non-invasive mask 
17 cases were mostly uh, were most commonly reported. Here we have independent risk factor uh, of occurrence of medical devices related uh, uh, pressure injuries uh, in a multivariate analysis uh, with the age of 46 to 64 years and B value of uh, 0.008 and odd ratio of 12.4. History of cardiovascular disease with a p-value of uh, uh, 0.021 and odd ratio with uh, 0.044. And we have also administration of vasopressor uh, with a p-value of 0.013 and odd ratio of 0.089. Also the length of ICU more than or equal to 22 days with a p-value of 0.0. For A and odd ratio with 0.055 requirement for medical ventilation uh, with a p value of 0.028 and odd ratio of 10.252 were identified as, a, uh, as, as we say, as independent risk factor for the occurrence of medical devices related pressure injury. The results um, of the study that uh, this study provides a comprehensive understanding of the risk of uh, the medical devices related pressure injury in critically ill adults. Uh, the incidence of the medical devices related pressure injury was high and was associated with several factors. It is uh, critical that medical devices related pressure injury are taken seriously by all members of the healthcare team, especially nurses, uh, and that protocols should be established for improvements. And now that's the end of my uh, observational cohort study. Thank you, everyone. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Uptisam or Dr. Naud? So, no thank questions. You so <clears throat> thank you so much, Thank you, Professor Tisam, Patria, and Professor Nod. Uh, these are great presentations. And it's very important to know about these things because hopefully, when you start your residency, you will have an idea. And uh, hopefully, uh, it's, uh, it's better to be on the defense side, like a preventive. Uh, approach to uh, like if you have patients in the ICU, most likely they will be intubated. So you think about the device to use, uh, also, so you think about how to prevent that or how to monitor for um, this, this incident, as well as other patients, patients with uh, as mentioned, medical problems like stroke or sight problems or unconscious or alcohol induced. Uh, Confusion. Some 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 people are just laying for long time, and so you want to make sure you are not causing a problem by adding the devices that you want to help and using it for a long time. So time is a key factor as well. As the other factors as you mentioned, the conditions the patient has, the age of the patient. Uh, so excellent, good presentation, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you, Dr. Nader, for your Thank comments. You. Uh, thanks a lot for Dr. Naoud and Dr. Tissam. It was really helpful and a great presentation. Uh, actually, we we faced it a lot in the in the hospital setting where people, especially uh, geriatric people, uh, like what Dr. Nader mentioned, the stroke patients, patients with dementia or advanced Alzheimer disease. They probably end up with permanent folic acid uh, catheter, for example, and that increased the risk for medical devices uh, injuries. Those uh, on, on endotracheal tube, for example, for a prolonged time. And uh, I believe also so the suprapubic catheter can play some, some role in the medical devices related injuries. So thank you so much, guys, for your presentation. Uh, I think I need to move to the next topic. Let me share my screen.
Okay. Are you able to see my screen, guys? Yes. Loud and clear. Good. Good. So I'll be I'll be speaking about the Prezi presentation or the Prezi like presentation. Actually, I, I wasn't aware of that previously, but uh, it's a nice tool, very effective and keeps your audience focused to, to your presentation because it has a nice smooth and dynamic moves of your of your slides. So um, the issue with the with the website that it gonna charge you like monthly some amount of of, uh, of money, but uh, I found a very useful link uh, on the YouTube on how to do a crazy like presentation on the PowerPoint, and I'll share the link with you guys after the presentation. So just to demonstrate and give an example of the of the crazy like presentation. Um, I did a quickly uh, presentation about the TGRF. So let's say we gonna speak about the introduction, for example. So once you click in the introduction, it gonna moves slowly, smoothly to the next slide. If you wanna go back to the to the main page, all you need is to click on the board. One click to the board get you back to the main page. Let's go to the aim, for example, the same here. One click to the board, get you back to the previous slide. When we move to the curriculum, one click kind of gives you, like you can, you can do more than one slide share. For example, in the curriculum, you have four main uh, bullet points. If you want to check the design, for example, one click, smooth and nice to the slide. If you want to go back to the previous slide, just a click, one click, and then going to the goal of the TG RF, a team player, the same, self improvement, the same. And if you want to go back to the main page, all you need is to click on the board. Now you are back on the main page. So just for the sake of demonstration, again, this is the slide. I can move to this slide by one click, simple and easy, and another click to the board to go back to the main page. One click to the curriculum, one click to the goal, one click to go back, another click. Um, in this case, you have to go to all the slides to finish your page. So if you if you click here, it's gonna go immediately to the last bullet point, self-improvement. And then one click here, gonna go back. If you click to the board here, it will move you to the main or the final bullet point, the achievements. One click again, one click, end of the presentation. I believe that's a nice and um, unique way to present your presentation because uh, your target as a presenter to keep your audience focused, to drag their attention with you. By presenting a unique and um, let's say stylish design of, of presentation uh, with more dynamics and smoothly uh, slides uh, switching, you can easily keep their attention focused. I'm going to share with you now the link where you will be able to learn how to do the Prezi like presentation on PowerPoint for free. You don't need to pay anything. Here's the link on the chat. <clears throat> and that's it. Any questions for me, guys? That was too short, I know.
it's so good actually yeah yeah i agree with you guys really i wasn't aware of that thanks for dr nader to exploring this new tool it's great for for the presentation and more importantly you don't need to pay anything to do it you can easily do it by a powerpoint presentation i mean especially those who who apply to the match this year they know what i'm what i'm talking about i mean spending more money and more money no <laughs> we 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 can't afford it really Thank you so much, guys. <clears throat> I hope that that is helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Muhammad. This is really uh, very helpful, uh, the demonstration as well. And uh, thank you for getting that uh, link. So hopefully people will play around to see how they can figure it out and uh, maybe uh, use it in the future when they present. But thank you so much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure, Dr. Nader. Thank you so much, guys, for your listening. And any comments? Any questions? Any comments? If not, go ahead. <clears throat> now, moving to the most crucial agenda the mock interview. All of us are panicking with this interview, and I believe we can make it so easy by practice and practice. So Dr. Sara and Dr. Mohammed, gonna simulate a mock interview now. And we are happy guys to receive any comments, any questions, anything you would like to add on, on the interview, some answers you would like to, to be uh, added, for example. So let's make it like an interactive session, okay? Dr. Sara and Dr. Mohammed, the mic is yours. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum assalam. Your presentation so far. Um, and uh, definitely, it's been very insightful. Of course, uh, the Prisa, I believe that the Prisa was also kind of like um, an extension from Endpoint, uh, EndNote, I believe. Uh, it has the same type of like uh, layout. Um, I, I, I was uh, just able to, to notice that from, um, from one of the presentations that were done back in 2018. Um, it kind of like, uh, uh, it kind of like uh, had like um, um, a spider web like, uh, presentation where you could actually it could actually hold out a whole lot of like uh, files that you could drag into and uh, it, it can keep it really neat um, for presentation purposes uh, so uh, but I'm really happy that there is uh, uh, that feature can be actually um, carried out by the uh, PowerPoint presentation which is uh, really good um, okay so moving on to this agenda that we'll have for um, for today. Um, I'm Mohammed El Gassim, and it's my pleasure to participate in our next uh, interview mock uh, session. Uh, we will be having two rounds, I believe. Um, and uh, for uh, for this time, I'll be taking over uh, with my partner, Dr. Uh, Sarah Abdulani. Um, I'll be taking uh, part as the interviewer role. Uh, for this uh, round uh, with Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah being the interviewee. So uh, we will be going through some of the commonly asked questions uh, during the interview. And so without further ado, uh, we will be starting our interview round. Uh, hello, Dr. Sarah. Um, thank you for choosing uh, to interview at our program this year. Um, I like to begin my interviews um, um, asking uh, questions, uh, self-introductory questions uh, that would give me a rather um, uh, more 3D uh, dimension to uh, what I see in your CV. So, uh, there, can you tell me more about yourself, please? Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, so, I'm Sarah Abdelghani from Sudan. 
I graduated uh, back in 2017, uh, and I'm currently PGY2 in internal medicine and a telegeriatric tele fellow, a uh, telegeriatric research fellow. Um, I'm a strong uh, advocate for volunteering, teamwork, and working in an integrated setting. Uh, I enjoy cooking, uh, baking, and maintaining daily journal. Okay, that's uh, and so um, what motivates you as a physician, Dr. Sarah? Well, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, uh, patient improvement, um, seeing the patient uh, improvement outcome, uh, as well as I enjoy practicing uh, internal medicine. And so uh, for uh, enjoying practicing medicine, why internal medicine in particular? Well, that's a good question. So um, thank you for asking me. I enjoy interacting with patients, uh, solving, solving their uh, mystery and uh, treatment uh, and, uh, and relieving their pain. So, and so what, uh, can you name me some strengths? Mm, I can say that I'm uh, dedicated. Um, I work well under pressure and um, I have a strong academic background. Um, I also have a leadership skills. Awesome. And so also, can you share me your weaknesses um so uh overthinking i i can say um yes. also self-criticism and uh my mom say uh, all the time that i'm uh, uh i'm multitasking like i can't focus in, in uh, one thing and so how about um, like as in where do would you see yourself uh, within the next five years? So, um, like after doing the residency, uh, I would like to pursue uh, uh, the, the, the fellowship and afterward, Mm, I um, I can start my uh, private uh, practice as well as working uh, in hospital setting. And um, so, how about the the kind of residency uh, program that you're looking for? What kind of residency would you like to match into? Uh, okay, so I would like to be a part of a program that support the resident and work in a friendly environment. And lastly, I, I, I want to get a satisfactory training to enable me to be a better physician. Awesome. And how about, what, uh, why, why should we take you into our, our residency program? You mean uh, uh, hire me? Yes. Uh, if we would hire you, um, why? What would be the reason why we would choose you um, to be hired? Oh, um, I work hard. Uh, I get along uh, well with my fellow team member, and I can get all. The uh, I, I can get all the tasks done. Very good. All right. So how about the, the um, additions that you may make uh, within the program? Um, should we take you into our program? So what kind of additions would you make if we had to take? So I'm an organized person. I can take 
uh, like initiative uh, in organizing uh, the work uh, environment for easy workflow. Um, I also like to lead projects that support uh, the residents' well-being. Um, I, I can also participate in teaching. Awesome. And why did you choose to pursue your residency in the States? Uh, because the U.S. is, uh, is well known for high standard uh, quality of patient care. And I want to get uh, the, the most uh, excellent uh, training that I can, I can do. Uh, so thank you so much uh, so far. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Um, One of the faculty members. Okay, so what qualities are you looking for in uh, your future resident? Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, for that, of course, um, uh, as one of the faculty members, um, we would like to have an energetic uh, personality, uh, just the work, um, a hard worker, dedicated uh, to the um, uh, to seeing patients' um, outcomes uh, getting better, and uh, um, it, we we would like uh, them to be multitaskers um, taking uh, over and following up more programs, uh, more uh, cases as they would come. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any more questions or I should give the floor also to uh, our fellow um, uh, colleagues, if you would have anything to interject with uh, or questions, should you have any. So Dr. Um, Muhammad Nahdad can be the program coordinator. So maybe there is a hand up from Dr. Ragada. Yeah, Dr. Ragada, go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Ragada. Uh, from what I, when he asked you about to tell more about yourself, this being the third year for me to blithe, you guys hear me, right? Yes. yes. Okay. For this being the third year for me to apply, and I did a lot of mock interviews and I watched a lot of webinar. So when he asked about to tell me more about yourself, what you did, you were listing adjective and you were telling about your CV, which is you shouldn't because they already have your resume in front of them. Yeah, that's uh, a very one, yeah. Um, from one of, one of the webinar I watched, you shouldn't say your name because they already know your name. Don't introduce yourself like my name is whatsoever or whatever. And in terms of medicine, I work in Sudan, born in Sudan. All that is written in the resume already. You shouldn't mention it again. Yeah. Uh, the, the second thing, when he asked you about your strengths, you are just saying adjective like I'm strong, I'm leader. You should link this to some kind of experience. So when you said that you are a leader, you should say like I was a leader to my junior during my last shift in internship. So that's strength. So and, 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 and. you get it. So you have to link that to stories. And uh, so what I just noticed from the mock interview, you were just listing skills, not actually linking that to residency and linking it to experiences. That's my only comment. You mean like giving an example of a certain strength points, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. when you said um, I, I have a good leadership skills since I was uh, during my last shift in my internship, I was a leader to my juniors leading them to guide them to write uh, patient care and uh, solve all the conflicts and all that. And then you can mm -hmm. say, Ms. Helen, yeah. telling the story. Yeah, tell the story, tell the story. Even if you didn't tell the story, tell about your experience in Sudan. Let's say uh, you can say that I can work under pressure, being working in developed countries with uh, limited resources that strengths my skills, strengths my uh, patient care and whatsoever. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Good point, Dr. Arta. Thank you so much. Any additional point, Dr. Naoud? 
Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, my input is I might not have watched a lot of videos about the interview, but the one thing that I have noticed uh, in the interview is just uh, she was like literally she had a memorized answer for the interview. So try to put it in a flow. If they think you have a perfect memorized answer for the interview, they will flip flop the question to know whether your real answer is that or not. So from what I have observed, you may have done the hard job of like observership or uh, volunteering or different score report. When you keep up uh, repeating the same answer, it gives them the idea that they have already prepared with a perfect answer. So they may say you were saying like your uh, biggest weakness may be overthinking and you love to enjoy cooking stuff. If they put that question in the next five minutes in a different form, and if you are only prepared for that format question, then you will end up giving the wrong answer. So when you try to provide information or answer, try to make it in a flow, but don't lie, of course, obviously. So try to put it like in a flow so that they make you make them feel that this is like a genuine answer. If you keep on saying that I'm excellent, I'm this, I'm that, this is like bullet point presentation. So you can have easily say that, well, I fell in love with uh, cooking. Last time I went to an ice cream place and I fell in love with cooking. I did this, I did that. So you are literally let them, you are leading them into a, like a flow conversation rather than yes or no mm -hmm. uh, format mm -hmm. of the question. Thank you. I mean, like just, just to be yourself and speak fluently and express your experience in a nice way, not like memorizing them. Yeah. That's that's a valid point. Um, Dr. Dua, go ahead. Yes, hi, do you guys hear me? Yeah. So I have two inputs. Um, maybe it will come with practice, but the first one is try looking at camera all the time because uh, I noticed that you look up to try to remember things about you. Just try to look at the cam. Uh, the other thing is when you mentioned your weaknesses, don't just uh, mention them lightly and you go over them and uh, try to also mention how you're trying to overcome them or how you're coping with them to overcome That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input. Mm, any any additional comments? Noura? Yeah, go ahead, Noura. Hi, everyone. We just would like to comment about the background. It is simple things, but it affects a lot. If you have a good background, it's going to be helpful. And the camera level is up, and so your face is going to be um, appearance so very well. Thank Maybe you. because it's it's a mock interview, not a real, not a real yeah, one. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Nora. So, any additional comments? Questions? Yes, there is another question he could have asked her. Like, um, you could have asked her, like, can he teach me something? That, especially for the university programs, they want you to be good at teaching because there's some students gonna come around. So they will ask you, like, can you teach me something now? So you can say, like, I can make sugar cookies and the way to make sugar cookies. Nah, 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 nah. That will show them how you go in the elaborating thing. You shouldn't make mm -hmm. it something hard. They're all doctors. So don't do something in other ways, just cookies. Yeah. You said you like cooking. So you can just yeah. pick up something from what you cook. And I believe it can be in the medical field or even outside the medical field. And that's if, correct. You can, if, you, yeah, if you can teach me something, yeah, that's okay. right. Um, and then another question. I'm oh, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, sure. Another question he could have asked her, like, can you tell me about something that's not written in your resume? <laughs> Or that's something that mm -hmm. happened to you last week. Mm -hmm. You can just make up something. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Darda. Um, I think it's the time to switch roles, right, Dr. Sarah Muhammad? Uh, we didn't have that in uh, in our agendas, but uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, if if you would like to play the role of, uh, I thought that there was different um, uh, agenda that was um, uh, uh, you. Uh, 
you and Dr. Uh, Patea. Yeah, Patea might yeah, uh, we, go we, ahead. So yeah, that, we, we cancelled it lately. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm well prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, neither <laughs> I it through, uh, like coming into the sessions, uh, mm. thinking it would be a, a straightforward presentation, as in PowerPoints for guidelines and stuff. Then uh, we had mm -hmm. the, uh, just to, to improvise with this one. So, but uh, I'm glad about um, pulling it out and having the feedback that we uh, we got so yes. forth. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Uh, one more additional point I'd like to to add. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not the best one in the interview for sure. But uh, when Dr. Sara mentioned about the fellowship. I believe it's more valuable when you mention that the type of fellowship, which which speciality is it like endocrine? Is it ICU, GI? To mention specifically the the speciality of fellowship, they they want to know that we have um, a short term plan, a long term plan, like ten to fifteen years plan. That's my additional point. Any other comments, Doctor Nader? If you would like to add something. Uh, I think you are muted, Dr. Nader. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahalita and uh, well, Dr. Sarah. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, I think you did great, uh, but always there is room for improvement for all of us. Uh, so when, like, uh, as the doctor, I think you mentioned, when you talk about yourself, try to uh, tell a story, like right? I was born in Toto and uh, I was interested in medicine because when I was a child or whatever, uh, like what you wrote a piece, and I, I said that uh, in the personal statement, so you can incorporate some of the story why you are interested in medicine. And as you mentioned, so I graduated from uh, school, and I practiced in uh, this area, let's say in Sudan or in the Gulf or whatever, and mentioned some of the difficulties for uh, these uh, uh, places. They have limited uh, resources, which made me uh, better uh, with uh, clinical skills and so forth. And then you can add the last part of what uh, how this is like. So in general, make it add story. I usually. Uh, 30 seconds to one minute or two minute kind of uh, duration, not longer than that. And you don't want to repeat the CV of your resume. You can borrow some items from it, but put it as a story uh, for you. Same with the questions. When they ask questions, I think one of the fellows mentioned, don't give yes, no question or a uh, short answer. Maybe. They want you to show that you can speak fluently, you can express yourself. Also, uh, body language. So you are just when, uh, on the screen, uh, try to use your hands, your movement of your face or neck, and smile. Whatever they ask a question, put a smile. And then sometimes we act. So let's say they ask a question that you know the answer and you memorize it. Don't say it as if it's memorized. Put uh, an act that you are thinking about the question. Or give it a second or two, and then remember the story. So I remember when I was doing this, 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 this happened, this, this, this. So the question about your uh, leadership. So you can say, and um, one more thing, um, uh, I have a good uh, leaders, uh, leadership skills, uh, because uh, when I was, um, in my second year, I was teaching the, the newcomers this and this, and uh, I found myself doing a good job. Or you are teaching, so I have good teaching skills, uh, so on so So these are things that you want to uh, mention. Uh, the other thing, when they ask about weakness, you can mention some of the weakness, but as one of the fellow mentioned, uh, you want to say, let's say, I I, uh, I do uh, focus on multitasking. Uh, this, and this by itself could be something 
uh, of weakness, but I think there is scope of improvement. So what my plan is to try to, uh, let's say, simplify the thing into a task, small task. So I will do task number one, prioritize that, and then task number two, and task number three, and I will finish the job instead of um, not completing anything. Uh, for example, this is my approach in, in the future to learn to improve on this weakness. Um, that uh, for some of the answers, you want to give some what we call a date. So you want to uh, give them uh, the answer you want to give them, but you can use some of the things that you want to elaborate. Let's say uh, I'm, I'm interested in, no, let's say, um, um, a team leader or a team player. Uh, so uh, you can say during my fellowship now here yeah, uh, at MSU, Michigan State, in this special um, fellowship, we work on different projects. And uh, we published uh, an, an abstract. So by saying that, then they will ask you what kind of abstract. So you can uh, lead them into asking you some questions that you already have from ready made answer or your experience can help you with this answer. So you can direct them to areas where you want them to go. So uh, fellowship is, is a good thing. Uh, as mentioned, Dr. Muhammad, when they ask you, uh, what do you think you will be in the future after you graduate from this program, for instance? You can say, I don't know exactly what I'm interested in after doing the exam medicine. I will see what other uh, fellowship offers, or if you are interested, let's say, Mohammed, you are interested in PI. So you will say, uh, my short term is to finish with your medicine. After that, I want to become a GI specialist, so I will pursue or complete the fellowship in GI, I mean, in GI specialist uh, area, for example. So you have uh, uh, short term goals and then long term goals. Uh, if you want to become in the academia, you want to teach, you love teaching, then you will say, after finishing internal medicine, I want to become an academic um, team uh, or faculty member so that I can teach medical students and residents and so forth. This kind of uh, short term, long term um, goals. So, this is how you do it. Uh, as far as um, the, the light, I think you are doing great. Uh, however, I think the camera is either on your down below your eyelid. I think it's uh, down. Is that true? Your camera? Is it on the table? Sarah? Yeah. So if you look behind you, behind your face, there is on the ceiling, there is some light. And that light shadow your your face. So make sure the eye the, the camera if you put it a little bit above your eye level or your um, forehead more and put it down to see you, maybe the light, uh, it feels like some windows of light behind you. My, my idea is if your background doesn't have light, it's better. So if you move yourself and again, it's a wall that doesn't have light, it's better than uh, you face the the hallway of the room and the light on top of your behind you. Uh, what you. I do, yeah, what I do, I have a light here. We are seeing a green screen, Dr. Yeah, let, me, let me stop there. Oh, yeah, let's see. Uh, So this is my office, for example, and here there is a light. So I put it in front of me, facing me. So if there is a light in front of you, then you can be a little bit, the, the light can be, your view might be better. If you have two lights, one on the right and on the left, maybe even better. Otherwise, make the light in front of you, so your chair or your Computer is supposed to be facing the wall with no light behind you. Something like that, if that makes sense. But 
I think you did great uh, for first uh, time interview, and uh, I know uh, it needs practice. The, the more you practice, the better. Uh, try to smile and uh, give some uh, free yourself from the stress. It's easy for me to say, but if they feel that uh, you are not in stress, it's better. Your answer might be easy. The flow might be easy. And uh, try to be as honest with your answers. They will figure that out. If you are trying to uh, lie to them, maybe it will be uh, obvious. So try to give a good, straightforward answer. Or, uh, kind of Thanks. Answer. Thanks, Thanks answer. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. For your valuable inputs. Um, I think we have two comments. Dr. Fathia, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Fala, you did amazing. Honestly, you had an answer to every question. You did not hesitate. So and now you feel like, I know you feel a bit glow and under the microscope right now, but it's a very good opportunity for you. So uh, one advice I could give you, um, I would invest in an HD camera, honestly. Um, you can see my like background, you can see my camera, my setup and everything. So this is me with no ring light on. This is just the camera that I got. And honestly, I think it's uh, it might be a very good investment using like an HD camera versus the like laptop camera or any other phone that you might have. So it could just, you know, it might be a bit clear. And uh, you might need an HD uh, to get a ring light as well if you don't have like a very good lighting where you are. Um, so I don't have the ring light on right now, but I can turn it on for you just so you can see how it is. Um, just, uh, you know, it's way too bright, honestly, but you can like turn it down a bit as well. You can turn it up as much as you want to. Um, so depending, but I would definitely invest in an HD camera and a ring light if you want to. Just to fix the whole issue with the lighting and, you know, the viewing itself. Yeah. Yeah. Problem with people no. with, with eyeglasses, when you put the light, yeah, it's gonna be somewhere <laughs> on it. That's actually right. That's why I had to get contacts. So, you know, they exist. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm suffering with, with this, really. I don't know how to yeah. put the camera and people mm -hmm. can see me clearly. So maybe yeah. I, I can do a, a laser you, later on. But your lighting is perfect, actually. Like, we can see you clearly. Uh, it's perfect. I think it's perfect. Yeah. In fact, that the light is coming from behind, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm lucky today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fatheya. Of course. Uh, Dr. Rowan, go ahead. Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, Dr. Sarah, you did great. And uh, I think uh, all the things have been covered um, for you to work on. Just one more addition. Um, Dr. Mohammed, when he asked you at the end, uh, what questions do you have? I think. I've, I've always been told to uh, ask a lot of questions uh, just to show that you're eager to know about the program, you're, you know, um, you're interested, um, again, about the program and, uh, you know, to learn more about your duties and stuff like that. I just, uh, maybe if you can ask more questions, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Dr. Nader can help us with that. I'm not sure if, you, if, if an applicant asks about um, the city, for example, or any entertainment activities, what do uh, residents uh, usually do outside of, outside of the work or stuff like that? Is it acceptable to ask such question or we have to be like academic or formal? What do you think, Dr. Nader? No, I think uh, it depends. I think the, the the opportunity when they ask you this question, do you have any question? They want to say, they want to show, they want you to show them that you are interested in their program. So it's an opportunity for you to say, I know, and then you can mention some of the qualities of the program. Let's say you have someone in the program, you know, they have some activities, as you said, beside the program outside. So you can mention that. So I know some of your residents, um, they play soccer or they do these kind of activities. Uh, and then you can add to that the question that you have. So 
my question would be, so I know that some of your presidents, they have other activities besides the seeing patients, uh, some of them play soccer, for example. And my question is, what other, um, or, um, what other service to help residents for from the burning out, for instance? And that mm -hmm. might be a question. Instead of asking the question directly, say, um, um, you can say uh, from the record here, I see that you have very good um, uh, board exam passing uh, mm -hmm. from the previous batches. Uh, what What do you think about um, your resident interest in geriatric? Uh, how many do you think they go that route from your program or something that you want to explore more because I'm interested in geriatric after doing my residency? Something like that. Um, uh, one thing you can mention about, um, for example, uh, how is your program offering uh, telemedicine? Uh, I didn't find that in your website. So the, the opportunity of asking the question is not only you want to ask a question by itself, you want to show them that you have an idea about their program, but you want to complete that picture for yourself to decide, oh, this is a good program for me or not, it's not a good program for me. So you want to show them that you did some homework. You, you looked at the website, you asked people in their program if you have some connection, you have some uh, good stuff about, let's say, um, schooling, if you have family. So these things, you want to, to show them that you collected some information, and then you can add the question related to what information you collected. Mm -hmm. There is no limit as far as how many questions, but a few questions, and then you can say, if I have more, I will try to reach out to you via email for more questions, something like that. So ideally it would be three to four questions, maybe? Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and to know or, or to show them that you, you did your homework and you shared their, their website, uh, mm -hmm. There is an idea. It's, it's pretty helpful uh, to mention that I have read in, in your website that uh, you offer a GI for fellowship, for example. Can you speak more? Can you tell me more about, about that fellowship? So you ask the question and you show them, meanwhile, that you have read yeah. the website yeah. and you know all the information. It, yeah, provided. exactly. And that's what I meant. It's not about knowing about the program. It's about showing them that you're interested and that you, know, you did your homework about the program and you know they'll be happy and they'll think yeah uh maybe this person is yeah um did their homework and knows a lot about the program and stuff yes yeah. indeed and i think if you uh just give it like to put in mind to give it two or three questions at the end it i just feel like it's always good to give to to give them to ask them some questions actually that's from that's, your a vital, that's a vital part of the interview if you don't ask any question that means maybe you're not interested in, in our program you you don't know uh, or you don't want to know more about our program you don't want to ask anything about the program so that could be a red flag as far as i know yeah, and I think this goes for all kinds of interviews, not only medicine, mm -hmm. not residency. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so the the one of the things, some of the the, the programs websites they mention the passing score. So, if the program that you are looking for, um, they don't have that information, then you may be uh, able to say. Uh, I have seen that you uh, offer good education or training to your residents. Uh, my question would be, how do they do with the board exam? Something like that, if there is no information on the website. And you can say, uh, because I didn't find it in, 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 uh, when I looked at your program's website. That means you are interested in their program. You already uh, looked at their website. You searched, and this is the it's just the missing part that they are you are looking for in, uh, as part of the question. And same for other parts of uh, whatever question you have, if you 
don't find the information from their website, from um, learning from other um, residents in the program, if you know some, then you can ask these questions. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadir. I think we reached Dr. the end. Dr. Fachi, I can raise her hand. Uh, I think it's kept raised, or Dr. Fathia. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I thank you, Dr. Nadir. I just had a question. Um, I was told whenever uh, the program director asks you a question, you need to ask, start answering by giving an introductory sentence in the beginning. Um, as an example, if they ask me, how do you handle conflict? So if it were me, I would just be like, um, the way to handle conflict is just by communicating with the people, with your colleagues, and so on. But I was told that you have to give like an introductory sentence, uh, basically saying, Conflicts do occur whenever you know a lot of people are working together under stress. So just like an introduction. So should I give an introduction or just cut to the chase and give like a direct answer? Excellent question. Uh, so I think we discussed this uh, in the previous batches, batch one and batch two. And they mm -hmm. did similar to the uh, the mock interview now, and mm -hmm. we have some videos if you can look that up. But one of the interesting answers in the past is that when you have a question asked to you, try mm. to give your answer into three parts. Part one, as you mentioned, maybe an introduction or your background. And then mm. the other part is the answer that you want to give, just like the, whatever answer you think is right. Mm. And then the third part is additional information. And by additional information, this is what we think about adding some information that you can bait them. You can mm -hmm. give them an interested area where they can ask you more. You want to direct them to where you feel confident. Let's say, I uh, like teaching. So mm -hmm. my question, even if they ask me about difficult um, scenarios, so mm -hmm. I will say the background of difficult scenarios. And uh, I had this incident where I did whatever, and then you can uh, say, and um, out of that, I learned uh, to come up with uh, uh, teaching moment. So mm -hmm. when my students come with me, I will teach them this, this, this. So now they are interested in the teaching way of your method of teaching, something like that. So they may mm -hmm. ask you about that if you are interested, something like oh. that. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. Thank You're welcome. You. You're welcome. So no more questions. I think we we reached to the end of our presentation today. Thank you so much, guys, for your listening and patience. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Anything you would like to add? Yes, um, I want. And the next part, uh, I want you to help me. We have two parts. One of them is uh, project update. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Mohamed Benerbat and your team. Uh, congratulations. You already uh, got accepted for the publication that we shared with the group. So thank congratulations you. to all of you. Excellent. Good job. And also, I'd like to, uh, I don't see to show me if she's here. Uh, that, uh, how I have been presented uh, the poster and uh, make uh, the next thing. AMA challenge? Uh, yes. Okay. Not, not a challenge. The, um, what's it called? Let me just, <laughs> I just see this. S G I M. So basically, they have um, um, a poster that was presented yesterday, uh, the day before, uh, there uh, in the meeting, and uh, it, it's a good uh, opportunity where she also met with some program directors and some other uh, residents. Um, so. These meetings uh, are not only for the presentation, but also uh, connection and networking sometimes it helps. Uh, so 
thank you, uh, the team who presented that talk as well. You're welcome. Uh, I My know pleasure. there is other two uh, posters are coming soon to be presented, and we submitted to uh, one one manuscript and one poster we are working, or two posters and one manuscript we are working. So anyone with uh, with any updates as far as the work teams that you are working on, anyone wants to add any comments? Or... Akila is not here. Uh, no, I'm here, Dr. Nadir. Oh, you're Sorry, okay, I joined yeah. late. Oh, yeah. sure. No, no. Go ahead. <laughs> There's someone mentioning the chat that you are not here, so. Yeah, I just joined. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. So, Akila and Hafting uh, submitted the manuscript for the paper uh, two days ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday, we finally submitted our... Uh, manuscript. So I wanted to let you know about that today. Um, yeah, we, uh, so, I mean, I submitted it to uh, Emer Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal. So just waiting for the acceptance. Maybe it would take uh, two weeks. Yeah, sometimes it takes longer. So two to four weeks, we expect uh, a response. So hopefully they will review it faster and We'll hear uh, sooner from them. Yeah. That's good. In case they want to make us uh, do any changes and all that, re-edit it, or uh, any suggestions from their editors. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes the reviewer will mention, uh, "We want you to change this or this reference, or uh, and make a certain let's say table or some." And then they will comment and we will review the comments and make the changes that are required and resubmit it again and hopefully they will stick it. Yeah. Sometimes it goes straight forward, sometimes uh, no major changes and uh, edits might be there. Mm -hmm. So on this note, I want to thank everybody of my team and especially Dr. Nader to put in your time. I know how busy you are, but in spite of that, you would always respond to my text. Like I keep mailing you uh, in odd times, but in spite of that, you help me a lot. So I want to thank each and every member of my teammate and you. Thank you so much for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, thanks every. Uh, team members who work on that project and uh, also those who are working on other projects as well. So it's my pleasure to help you guys and uh, we we'll work as a team. And by the way, it helps you when, when let's say, Akila now you have a, an, an interview, they will ask you some questions. So one of the questions you may look or may elaborate on this project. So you will say, uh, my, let's say, they asked about strength. So you would say one of the, my strengths or skills, and I'm, I'm a team leader or a team player. So you will mention that, oh, by the way, we have this project where we work on developing this manuscript and uh, I help uh, submitting it and so forth. So I was a leader for the team, something like that. Uh, yeah. That's an example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, teamwork, team player, and leadership qualities, like, you know, leading a team. Yeah, makes sense. Sure. And Mohammed Mugdad, you can mention about the presentation. So you can say, I have good presentation skills. And by the way, we developed or we found this uh, about uh, four point presentation, but also there is some other software like Prezi where you present. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Apart from the weekly presentations that we do, uh, the webinar that uh, we hosted, I think I can also use that as an example. I mean, um, all the teammates that who have participated in the webinar. Sure. Um, yeah. Sounds good. So any, anything you did, uh, Akila or Muhammad or any of the other teams uh, as a team member or as a team leader or project leader, you can mention them as um, just injected it somewhere in your answers. And again, you put some information so that they can ask you more. So. Most likely, they will ask you tell me more about the, let's say, Akila, the webinar 
how did you do that? So it was uh, we collected this information, we think this is an important topic, we uh, contact the cardiologist and so forth. So we just elaborate a little bit. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lander. Okay. Anybody else wants to add comments uh, or updates or questions? Uh, if not, maybe I will uh, take you to the last part. Uh, so let me show to me you. Um, so next week, uh, agenda will be by the uh, segment of the Hopefully, they will go over this and uh, not sure if it's segment is present today. Uh, but uh, but uh, I know you are here, and uh, our team members they can. Um, go over this and see who will present what if any questions let me know uh, the other part i want to share with you is uh, let me uh, ask you some questions if you help me so if i want to start uh, a worksheet um, like this so if any one of you is interested in, uh, let's say, some programs. You got uh, five interviews in different programs. Uh, so, program name, and city, state. So, these are the basics of the program. Sometimes you may add some information about the program, uh, and, and that can be from the reader. Uh, something like that. So, I think there is online information where you can get the information from uh, the program or the run website. So what I would do if I were you, I will create something like that so that when I get, let's say, an interview from Chicago, um, Anyways, Chicago, uh, nice spelling. Uh, you know. So I get an interview from one program in Chicago. Let's say it's uh, you and C um, and Intel Medicine. They have uh, invited me for an interview. So I will go to their work, uh, website and then I will get information from that website um, so that i can be prepared so here where you will add um, whatever interesting information that you found in that program so maybe it's a small program uh, it's um, academic and it has uh, fellowships uh, within that program so most of the resident there they will uh, join some fellowship within the same institution so these are the positive points that you want to collect from that program how about the drawback or the negative uh, so maybe you don't like the weather in, in, in chicago so maybe you want to be on the south of uh, no family or friends in the area and maybe not good schools something whatever you think doesn't uh, meet your expectation but again you want to so to list the positive of that program and the negative of that program and you can put a score out of five for example you want to say uh, if this program is good for me where in my list i will say this is maybe it's four out of five, something like that. So when you have more programs, you add them here, and then, for example, uh, 
whatever other um, so you have more programs then when you put here your right banking list it's going to be easy for you to collect all this information and when they interview you you're going to be adding the data interview so i will save them in this so you will have um, some idea of the date of the interview so you collect the information about the program and then maybe you can add this question so question number one uh, both passes for example and then question number two um, out, um, let's say there now what are the strategies that they use for prevention uh, of burnout, for example, whatever things that you didn't find in their website. So you can ask a couple of questions, two, three, four questions. So when you are ready for the interview, at least all this information in one place. And when you've done this, all the interviews, you will come to the score, and then you can say, oh, I want to rank this one in number one for me. And then I go to Chicago, number two, I go to whatever New York, number three. So if you have a, a spreadsheet like this or Google Sheet, it's going to be easier for you to put all the information in one place, if that makes sense. Guys, it's just a way of organization of the information and make it easy for you uh, by the time when you are ready for the matching and sending the list, ranking list. Any questions? Okay. If no question, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mutata and your team for presenting today. Uh, we had very excellent presentations. Uh, I hope this will be helpful to some of you who present, uh, who are in this uh, meeting today, or who can review the recording later. But um, if no other comments, no other questions, uh, I'd like Dr. to. Yes. So I thought uh, Prashant is here. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. So, uh, sorry, Dr. Nadir. My signal no, got cut. Yeah, I was yeah. not able to join. But yeah. If you can give us uh, a little bit of uh, feedback of your uh, process presentation for the other day before. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah. um, hi, everyone. Uh, me and my team pre prepared the poster regarding the review of suicide trend rates before and during the pandemic. Um, we have the data access to Marion Counter's uh, office where we collected the data of 2019 as well as 2020. Based on the data, we prepared a, a po poster and submitted the abstract to the SGIM Midwest conference, which was held on October 6th and 7th. Uh, my post, uh, like uh, our poster was presented on October 6th and I was able to present it. So it's a... Uh, um, it's a regional conference, um, and uh, it was judged by two judges as well. Um, uh, there were a lot of like uh, uh, residents as well as attendings from uh, Midwest regions like University of Chicago, uh, St. Louis University as well. So um, I've, um, they, uh, during the presentation, I was able to present the uh, details about the poster and they asked a few questions related to data. So um, that's how the presentation went by. Um, so the data showed there is an increase in suicide trend rate in, in the pandemic when compared to the pre-pandemic era. Uh, so they, the suggestion from them was like to include mainly the data from the March 2019 to uh, March 2020. Whereas we included the data from January 2019 to uh, 
December 2020. So they wanted us to uh, to move the data for the three months ahead. Uh, that's a that's the main suggestion I got. Um, that's everything. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations again to you on your team and your team. Uh, I think it's it's uh, you work hard, uh, all of you guys, and you deserve the best. So that's a good thing. So I think the next step, if you want to get that right, uh, as well as for yourself, so use any platform, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or whatever. You can add your photo, anything about uh, that uh, conference and your process and your team. And um, I think there's an annual that. annual conference coming in May 2023, Doctor. So mm -hmm. there were uh, um, there's a abs submission timeline up to December. It's mm -hmm. it will be opening in October, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's the annual conference. This is a regional conference. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Ah, oh, no, that's it. So uh, again, uh, thank you for sharing this information because for other uh, fellows uh, who are interested, if you have ideas or if you have what is going on, so as Regina mentioned, uh, they have another uh, meeting, the annual meeting. So we can yes. submit a different aspect or more for it to that it, uh, meeting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like we can submit more than one abstract, I guess. There's there's a written, and that yeah. will be since this is a regional conference, uh, it will not be published. But mm. that uh, the coming one is an annual conference that will be published in the Society of General Internal Medicine sure. um, Journal of Internal Medicine. Sure. And sometimes what we do is even this uh, poster that is presented, we can look at the information uh, because it's been uh, some time since we collected the information. So if we look at the same information again, uh, as well can help us with that. So we'll have more data and we can, bear, we can compare two years before and two and years after. And then we can say, oh, by the way, we looked at this and we can answer the question that they mentioned here during the conference. But we have more data hmm. and we can present it differently uh, for the next day. Um, so if you are interested or someone else interested to carry uh, on. And that sure, doctor. Also... I, I, I mean, I, I was thinking too, so that um, like, as you suggested, if we collect the two years previous data and as well as two years later data, we can also show the impact of COVID very specifically, uh, like, if there is a definite increase in especially the pandemic era, mm -hmm. that can show this is because of the COVID. Yes. And uh, I think I discussed this with Abu Zaf in the past, and uh, I think the time limit was because you have okay. to submit it um, for the regional mm -hmm. But now I think you have more time if we can collect the information and look at the data. Good. Okay, doctor. I'll talk with yeah. Dr. Abuzar and as well as uh, I'll update you on it. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anyone else uh, wants to uh, update us or uh, join, uh, share some of the information? If you don't have any uh, projects you are not involved in, uh, please uh, shoot me an email. I know a couple of you uh, send me emails. Uh, if you can just send me more uh, any, uh, additional email just to remind me. Uh, I don't want to forget some of the projects that we are working on. I think some of you collected some data, so we need to work on this uh, uh, so that we can uh, present it to some of the conferences or some of the meetings. Uh, coming soon. So, if you have questions, if you have anything you need to share, uh, show me an email. I'd be happy to address this with you guys. But all in all, I think you are doing great. I wish you all the best and good luck. And uh, have a wonderful day or have a good night wherever you are. Thank you. See you next week.
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you very much, Dr. Nader and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Oh, thank you, Sir. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor Anna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.